Let's go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 6. You guys have been in the ministry and you know a lot about the Bible and so uh, I don't know if you're going to get any crystal new insights from all of this, but there are some lessons to learn. Amen? Amen. So the problem rises up, Acts chapter 6, it says, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to wait, uh, to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We'll turn this responsibility over to them and give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Uh, They select these people, they approve of them, and then in uh, the end we read about the number of disciples increasing rapidly again. So the problems, uh, I think, are somewhat obvious. Uh, We have now the very first signs of division in the church, the very first crack. Uh, In Acts 2.42, you know about how they were all together in one place, and uh, they shared everything in common. Acts 4, they, uh, you know, joined together in prayer, and God moved in a powerful way. And now we see this first little crack in the unity of the church shouldn't surprise us that there is division, and I've come up with a perfect solution how to uh, eliminate division in any church. You ready for this? You going to want to write this down. So if you have a 200-member church, one 200-member church, here's how you eliminate division. You create 200 one-member churches, and you'll never have problems again until they get frustrated with themselves, and then uh, it's all downhill from there. So uh, the disciples are increasing. It's a great thing when churches grow, but with that brings some issues along with that. Any growing church is always going to have stuff that deals with, and probably the biggest reason, like indicated here, is there is some cultural differences and personality things that arise You know about the Grecian Jews, those that grew up speaking the Greek language and in a very Hellenistic type of uh, environment, they adopted many of the Greek cultures and then uh, were also Jews. And then you have the Hebraic Jews, in their minds, the true Jews, the pure Jews, and anybody less than that, uh, not speaking the native tongue and not growing up with all the customs then they were somehow or another a lesser Jew. And so you had a little bit of snobbery going on, a little bit of arrogance, self-righteousness. And then on the other hand, you had some people that probably felt uh, picked on, discouraged, oppressed from time to time. And they had the inferiority complex uh, and always looking uh, at how they stood. And all of a sudden, now there's a legitimate issue here. It doesn't have to be uh, have ethnic origins. It doesn't have to be about this, but it could be about any type of cultural differences. Our fellowship is a great example of that. We all, and even in this room, there's people from all different parts of the world that are right here, and we all would call ourselves Christians, right? If not, we have plenty of water right out front, and we can take care of that later on. But we're all Christians, but I guarantee you not all of us think about Christianity exactly the same way. We can be of the same color and speak the same language, and even our interpretation of Christianity is slightly different from place to place. This does not necessarily imply that we're not unified. It just simply points out that we're all very different, and our environment plays as much a role as our, on our outlook of life as our convictions about the scriptures. And so we have this thing going on. All of a sudden there's this complaining that breaks out and literally if you look at how this is written, more accurately the word is murmuring. And I I see these two words as slightly different. Uh, The complaining, if someone complains, you kind of know where it's coming from, right? You know who's doing it because they're usually loud and they're in your face 
and it's visible and noticeable. The murmuring is more the silent stuff that's going on behind the scenes. It's the little pocket in the fellowship that all of a sudden looks like they're having a weird little conversation over in that part of the auditorium. Have you ever seen those? Yeah, not in your church. I've seen them in my church. Uh, it's the little grumbling. It's the little murmuring. It's the little whispers. You don't really know where it's coming from. Sometimes we can't even identify what the source of all of this is. But to me, that is more dangerous than people just outwardly complaining about what's going on. And so now we have a very legitimate issue that's at the apostles' feet here where division and unity in the church is at stake. And so what is their solution? Uh, I think obviously they have to, uh, uh, yeah, they, did I, I'm kind of new at this PowerPoint stuff, you know? Is it all right? All right, so as they do this, they could have gotten pretty defensive. Don't you feel that way when people have complaints and arguments? And, and like, come on. Now the church is perhaps, uh, a lot of writers think, maybe 20,000 members at this time in and around Jerusalem. They started with three. Couldn't the apostles said, hey, it, it, just in the last four years, we've had 17,000 baptisms, and you're going to gripe about this? Uh, you know, it, it, it's like... You could be defensive, but if you're a leader trying to solve things, uh, defensiveness is probably not a good approach to take. And so they, uh, they gather all the people together, they explain the situation, and then there's a, a level of trust that's placed among the people that they can solve problems. I think this is one of the keys of finding the good in every problem, is you also have people that kind of rise to the top that now have a role or a responsibility within the church to deal with whatever it is that may be coming up. Then the apostles still had an opportunity to prove it. They placed their hands on them, and then you can see that the church was back on track. So the setting of what we're going to talk about next is really this. Here you had a fantastic church, a large church, a growing church, a church that was relatively unified, if not completely unified, and then all of a sudden, a little bit here and a little bit there, all of a sudden now threatens the unity of the church. And so it brings us to a time when we went to Detroit, Michigan. Over the years, Lori and I, for whatever reason, we never planned this out, but we ended up going to churches that are struggling and uh, trying to help them get back on their feet. There's a long history of our ministry lives that's kind of been devoted to that. And so uh, we're sitting in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and my dear friend, uh, dear, dear friend, Jeff Balsam, his daughter Susan right, is right here, uh, comes to me. It's just before Christmas that year, and, he, and I knew that there was stuff going on in Detroit. One of our brothers was over there on business and happened to go to a midweek service where a fight almost broke out. And he calls me up and he says, Tom, you got to get on a plane. You got to get over here right now. And I said, bro, amen. We'll look into this, but that's not part of our family of churches right now. And nobody's asked us to come in. And so I knew that there was stuff going on. And then Jeff, just before Christmas, says, what would you think about going to Detroit? And I said, not much. We've only been in Milwaukee for three years. And, uh, and I didn't want to tell Lori, because I kind of knew what her reaction might be. Uh, we had just gotten settled. The church there had turned around. It was starting to grow. And the thought of picking up and moving again after three years, uh, I didn't want to go into the holiday season with laying that on my wife's plate. And so she's going to pick up the story. <laughs> And for that reason, I love this man. <laughs> he protected me. I had a great Christmas. But anyway, <laughs> what had happened in, in January then, as we went through the holidays and everything, um, what actually happened was Detroit did call Chicago, the Chicago leaders, for help. And they, they said, we need help. Come, come help guess, resolve this problem, these issues that are happening with the, with the, and the leadership level. And uh, so... 
Two elders, a teacher and an evangelist, hopped in a car and went over there to see what was actually going on. And uh, so, you know, after many meetings, many talks, whatever, they came to some conclusions and, some, and they had more discussion. And so the, the core group there said, you know, what, what do we need to do? And, and basically, because they didn't seem to have a resolution, the, the Chicago leader said, well, you need to let the two staff couples go and we'll need to rebuild here. And so then they were like, oh, okay, well, what, what do we do now? And uh, they were asking them. And so uh, Darren Gauthier, who was an elder in Chicago, he kind of piped up and he said, well, you need a couple like the Wilsons. And I'm trying to think, did you emphasize like the Wilsons? And so they, their response was, well, can we get the Wilsons? Can we get them? Is that, that even a possibility? And he said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. We just need to check this out. But you need, you know, the whole idea was that you need someone to come in and help heal and prepare and re repair what's been damaged here. So like Tom said, we did not want to leave. I was not real happy with the whole idea of even leaving Milwaukee. And... Um, when, when they came back and met with us to even discuss this transition, Darren told me what happened, what went on, and what he said. And I said, brother, what did you do? You threw our names out there. Why did you throw your names out And I was so mad. I was just so ticked off. I said, you can't do that. And he was like hanging his head low. He said, like, yeah, I'm sorry. I just popped out, you know. <laughs> but anyway, um, short the long story short we ended up um, did after much prayer and, and fasting and, and looking at the situation we felt like we needed to make that move yeah. Lori put Darren in the doghouse and about a year later let him out so uh, yeah. not literally Darren Sharon real dear friends of ours you know, uh, some of us, if our movement is going to move and if issues are going to get resolved, some of us are going to have to be willing to leave our comfortable settings where we may be and go to some place that maybe is not quite as glamorous as where you live now. It's not as nice. Uh, you know, you know what you're going into and you know what you're walking away from but you're going to have to wrestle with some of these questions that God may put on your heart. I was wrestling with it a lot, and the passage that I couldn't get out of my head, God, I think, just put it in there, was uh, James chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food, if one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. I made calls, I tried to get other people to go to Detroit, and nobody wanted to go, and, and so I had to wrestle with this all the more. If it was about clothes and food, pretty much anybody could have resolved that, but I feel like God had been preparing us like he's preparing you for something else into the future, and someday you're going to get that call, and you're going to have to wrestle with this thought just like we had to wrestle with it. If I can do something about it, but I don't want to do anything about it, what does that say about my faith? That's what I couldn't get out of my head. And then I realized this was of God. God was putting this on our heart. Okay. Go to the next slide here. So after we make the decision to go, and I, I think the, the Spirit nudged us, perhaps punched me and compelled us to make the move, uh, then we got to Detroit and we started to find out what we were getting involved with. I'd like to say this in the beginning, whatever you hear about what's going on, it's only hearsay until you're actually there and you start talking to people. So many times, I think we've all made this mistake, we've heard one side of the story, maybe we've heard another side, we've formed our own conclusions, and we start working accordingly, but then only later we find ourselves a little bit embarrassed because our judgment was way off. 
And so we've got to know what's going on. We were told that this is about race. It was about the African Americans in the church and the whites not getting along. One of the couples that was on staff was African American, the other was white, and that was part of what we were told. That's one example. But after we got there and started talking, we found out that race literally had nothing to do with what was going on in Detroit at all. It was only after we got there and started to find out, which Lori's going to share about in just a second. The other thing that I think frustrated people is everybody wanted to know, what's your plan? What are you going to do? Why are you coming? How are you going to do this? And we uh, just said, you know, we don't have a plan. Here's what our plan is. Our plan is to come up with a plan. But until we're there, we have nothing to offer other than what we're going to do sometime in the future. So you're going to have to take some of that by faith. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, in Proverbs 18, verses 2 and 13, says, A fool finds no pleasure in understanding, but delights in airing his own opinions. He who answers before listening, that is his folly and shame. So we really felt like we needed to find out from the members what, how they were feeling, what they, were, what they had gone through, what they thought about it, and we were thinking, how, how are we going to be able to do this? How can, we, how can we just find out more? So what we did was we, we met each house church one by one in their groups in their, that they usually meet, met together, or their or house churches, or I don't know what you call them, family groups, or everyone has a different name for the small group. But anyway, we wanted to go to their, to their home so we knew exactly what part of Detroit they were in to see their environment ex and, and see exactly where they were. And just started asking a lot of questions, like, how, like I said, how you're feeling or whatever. But we were wanted to just listen. We wanted to hear their hearts. We wanted to hear their, their, if they had attitudes, if whatever they felt. And, but we didn't want to give them any answers right away. We just wanted to listen to their hearts and see what was actually going on. Um, we needed to understand, have that understanding before we were going to make changes. And the, actually, the responses were very good. There, some people were really open. Some people were angry. Some people were just totally confused and help us understand what's going on. Some people shared us the history of the church, you know, what had happened up leading up to this and what had happened. So it helped us understand more how they were feeling. And, and some of them were just, I don't know. You know, I don't know what was happening here. <laughs> Not everybody in the church was affected. There were certain pockets that they just were like, okay, we're fine, but, you know, what's happening with the church from right now? But uh, we could see the hurt. We can see the damage that was done, and, and uh, we just needed to listen to their story, basically. Your heart goes out to people. If, if you're able to disconnect just a little bit and listen to what people are going through, then your heart goes out to them, and instead of seeing them as problems, you just see people like yourself at the various times in your life that have been hurting, and somebody listened to you, and that's what helped you move on from there. I think as we did this, we, I, we pushed pretty hard, so for about a month and a half, we went from house church to house church, 27 of them, and uh, we had, you know, like three or four a week we were doing this, and then there were certain patterns and themes that started to emerge. Some on one side, uh, nothing's going on, we're fine, everything's cool. They were oblivious to what was really going on. Others were like, what, what is the deal with our communion bread? Why can't we have communion bread that tastes good? And uh, uh, No, literally, somebody was complaining about communion bread. So I'm telling you, it was a little crazy. But then all of a sudden, there was an image that started to form and, and become clear of what was really going on within the church. And I, I want to share with you just a few things. And I'm doing this not to, uh, not to sling mud or anything, but I think it's important to know that whatever you think the problem is, there's a reason that it's there. 
there's something, maybe not even in the recent past, but in, even in the distant past, there's certain things that have come into play, elements that are affecting how disciples behave and how they think and where their faith is. And so if you go to just simply the immediate thing that is going on right there at the moment, you may miss actually what the real bigger picture is of why people are responding this way. And so as we, uh, we got to know this stuff, uh, the church at one time uh, was nearly 600 members. It was one of these churches where it just kind of exploded upward, and then within about two years, it imploded down to about 300. So you can imagine that, being in a church that you've seen go like this and then go like this. Uh, you can make some judgments and assessments about how it was built. Uh, many of those people that were a part of this big expansion were no longer part of the church after uh, a couple years, and it was very defeating. You know how it is. You have a baptism, and then you find out about somebody that's going to walk away from the faith, maybe permanently, maybe for a while, it's discouraging. As exciting as baptisms are, people that walk away from the faith are even more discouraging than baptisms are encouraging. At least that's how I feel about it. Uh, the division in the church was really about the division of leadership. You had two couples, in and of themselves, great people. One had some very noticeable strengths, and so did the other. They each had some noticeable weaknesses and they were polar opposite of each other, and therein lies part of the division. Uh, there were uh, nearly a hundred members that were contemplating going off and starting their own church, uh, kind of led by one of the couples that, to my knowledge, they're not faithful anymore at all. Uh, maybe they worship in their home or whatever. But they were the ones that were kind of silently peddling this idea, the murmuring uh, that started to take root. Some people were being manipulated into thinking this was a good idea, let's start our own congregation. And they didn't even realize that that was the direction that they were being led. In the end, there was only about 20 people that actually left. Uh, there was a history of turnover in the Detroit church. Uh, Every year, every couple years, there's been a turnover. Uh, all churches have turnover. Uh, you've probably been part of a turnover at one time or another. You were here, and then you were there. Uh, and then you were there, and now you're over here. Uh, that's, all that stuff is good, but if it happens too much, it can really damage the church that it, it's happening to. And some of this turnover was not normal turnover, it's what I would call ugly turnover. I don't have to paint any pictures there. The church had gone through a period where they were just now getting out of uh, well over six figures of debt that had been incurred for various reasons. There was some lack of trust that was going on. There was a small group of false teachers that had arisen. I call them the Holy Spirit boys. Uh, like if you didn't say the Holy Spirit in every other, every other sentence, then you obviously weren't being led by the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know what I'm talking about here? Yeah. And then the, the weird, really deceitful twist on that, they had kind of worked their way into the lives of some of the single sisters where now all of a sudden they were enamored by this teaching of the Holy Spirit but they themselves were not all that spiritual themselves. That, and then, I'm just painting the story for you, on top of all of that, this all occurred right when the Detroit economy bottomed out. You remember back in 2008, 2009, Detroit was on the news, the city that died, uh, the population of Detroit uh, proper at one time was uh, two million or so, it was down to about 500,000. Uh, where you drive, you'd see nice neighborhoods, and then right one block over, you would see burned out neighborhoods. It was devastating. And so during this time, uh, we had about 100 members that actually moved out of Detroit. 
And it wasn't because they had issues with the church, they lost their jobs. Many of them were well-paying jobs. Uh, Twelve of these couples were house church leaders. So on top of all this other stuff, now we have this that comes into play where this, there's this exodus over two years. We didn't fault these people. You gotta, you gotta feed your family. You gotta pay the bills, right? Uh, but nonetheless, that was part of what was going on. People were divided, they were discouraged, and there was a breakdown of trust. Yeah. Well, the biggest thing, one of the biggest things was the trust. You know, just trusting leadership and trusting, okay, who's, take, who's gonna take care of us? Who's, you know, who's gonna lead us in that sense? But uh, so there's a, a couple things that we did, I think, at first, because they were divided in regions and they were meeting separately for quite some time, we needed to pull the whole church together. We need to bring them all together for worship and to, to have all the members together. And, and what, that, what that did was because when they first started coming to church, they would still sit in their groups in the audience. You could tell, you know, they, were, they weren't mixing at all. That, so there was such a disconnect in their relationships. So, and, and so we thought, okay, this is good. We need to meet together. <laughs> it's obvious that we needed to meet together. But um, that was a super, it was just so interesting to me how separated they were even at the earliest start there. And then we just started from, from core group down to working on building their trust in, in us and, and just even trusting God, just bringing their hearts back to the scriptures, what that meant to be a leader, what, it, what did it mean for them to be, to be walking with God all over again. And as Tom said, you know, when you start listening to people, your heart really does go out to them because you hear their experiences. And we could just see they were losing their faith. They were just, just so focused on what was happening with the church that their, their faith in God was drifting and they were with the, along with the trust in that. I, um, uh, I, sometimes we can see in our, in our groups and our churches, there's some people that are invisible. They aren't given the focus or the attention or whatsoever. And I took a group of women that were not married to non-members. There, were, there, were, there was a good selection of them, and, and they just felt like they just didn't have any support whatsoever. So I pulled the women together, and I started a group for them. And, you know, just to build their faith. I did lessons on building their faith, helping them in their walk with God, just getting them in the scriptures to encourage them. I didn't even talk about their marriages. I just said you need to focus on God. You need to focus and walk with him. And so that was super encouraging. One of the gals later on, she, she evidently took the group over and she was leading it from there on. Um, the mature sisters, the older women, you know, they needed, they needed just, to be in, just to be visible again. And they had their own group and they, you know, they were doing okay. But once in a while, Tom from the pulpit, he would just mention them by name or whatever, just throw them a bone, you know, just then they were super encouraged. They'd be like, oh, Tom, you know, and, and he recognized us. But there's people in your churches that are invisible. And you have to bring them to the bring them to to a point where they're visible, and they, they get encouraged, and they think, okay, I am special, I am somebody in this church, you know. Um, so just identifying that that disconnect that we have with each other and with the people that are not visible in the church. Secondly, we we wanted to be able to open their eyes beyond Detroit, and we brought some outside speakers in from the Midwest and from some other places. To bring in some fresh uh, preaching, just some just different ideas, mostly about faith, just bringing them into helping their faith and trust in the leadership and widening their vision for not just Detroit, getting them to think outside. Uh, the discipling, we made sure that their discipling was happening because it was all over the place. And we gave them the freedom, actually, just to decide. You can, you know, get well one-on-one -on -one discipling if you want, or you can be in a group. It's your choice. But everyone is going to get discipling. Everyone's going to have someone in their life that's going to help them spiritually. No one's going to slip through the cracks. Yeah. And then lastly, we, we came with the attitude, we're here to serve. We're leaders, and we need to be visible as, as leaders. 
So we were participant in, in all, most of the HOPE projects, the local HOPE projects. We did vacation Bible school. You know, we, all the events that we had, we made sure that we stayed and fellowshiped and cleaned up and afterwards and swept the floors and washed the dishes. You know, people needed to see that, oh, okay, they're, they're part of the family. They are the family, and they're interested in us, and they're not just up teaching a lesson from time to time or whatever, but that was that, that we were visible in that way. Yeah, amen. There was uh, the Sunday, you remember the San Antonio conference? We had a huge group from Detroit. I'm sure many uh, people from your churches too. Uh, these older ladies that Lori was talking about, they, they came down in a group. They were standing outside the hotel one day, and so I'm telling this in front of the church the Sunday after the uh, San Antonio conference. I, I said, uh, there's several sisters here that I, I have to bring before the church publicly, and the whole auditorium goes quiet. <laughs> and uh, I, I said, it's not good, it's fairly serious, but let me tell you what happened. So these ladies were standing outside the hotel and they found a cooler sitting by the side and no, it was just abandoned. So one of the older ladies, they brought the cooler uh, over to their stuff and all of a sudden a police officer walks up and says, look, you can have my cooler, but please give me my sandwich. <laughs> That's it. it. And uh, so they, they got brought before the church for that. It was kind of fun. They were excited. They were, they were put before the church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you have cracks in your church. There were some obvious cracks in Detroit. And uh, there will always be cracks. They'll never be completely filled or fixed. Uh, there's, they're always going to be there. And once you get one fixed, there's only a matter of time before other cracks appear down the road. And you said, you said, yeah, I wanted to be in the ministry. Well, that's part of what it's all about right there. So, uh, you know, what, what do we do? Here, here we are, we're sitting, we've lost 100 members. We're just kind of getting over this hump with the, the divide. And, and so we have people that we now have to trust that really don't have any experience. Like some of them some of the new house church leaders, Bible talk leaders, family group leaders, whatever terminology you use, some of them were not even all that good about being, bringing refreshments to Bible talk. And, and now they're leading Bible talks. Uh, but that's what we had. And, and so the good that comes out of that, had these other people not left, none of these people would have had an opportunity to lead a house church or a Bible talk. And most of those that uh, we pulled into service back then are still leading in Detroit even now and, you know, uh, several years down the road doing a much better job with it. We had uh, to get this group back into this house church mindset. Uh, I, I'm sure all of you have house churches, Bible talks, family groups, but some small group that people are connected to. We started teaching about this, uh, did a series on, on midweeks about all of this, and about halfway through this series, or, or halfway through the first lesson, I just kind of got the feeling like people were not getting it. Like, what, what is your problem? I was getting a little irritated, to be honest with you. I'm not saying that was right to get irritated. I'm just telling you that's what happened. And so I stopped and I said, so how many of you were part of a house church, Bible talk, family group, as part of your conversion experience. And I kid you not, there were less than 10 people that actually raised their hand. And so we realized, man, so what we're talking about now is like a new language for people. And now in Detroit, even now, there's functioning house churches and people have a better understanding of the one another relationships and making them work. These are some of the, the things. I think another thing is to try to get the right people serving in the right job. <clears throat> there were some people serving in different capacities, and I, I'm not saying this to be mean, but some of them were actually perhaps doing a little more harm than good 
because it wasn't their gift, it wasn't their temperament, it's not what I think God had intended for them to do, they were just in that spot. So now you have an opportunity in order to help this church grow, is try to get people more in line with their gift set, their talents, their abilities, and as much as possible, we would ask people, what do you want to do? What is your passion? What can you get excited about? And try as much as possible to match, match up those with the needs that were in the church. I think the other thing became clear is we need to uh, bring in some extra people for help. <clears throat> we had one young couple, Colin and Beth Cheryl, who are here, uh, and then we eventually sent them out to plant the church in Des Moines, Iowa. They just recently were asked to go to Minneapolis, Minnesota to lead the church there. But when we got there, they were almost begging us to take them out of the ministry. They said, now look, if you want to bring somebody else in, we'll, we'll resign. Uh, no, no, we believe in you. No, I, no, we're just telling you, you're not going to hurt our feelings if you ask us to resign. Because in the absence, all the people with critical attitudes went to them but it wasn't their fault at all. They were over in Ann Arbor leading the University of Michigan ministry, but since they were one of only two people that were still on staff, they took all the heat. So their faith had to get built back up, and I think it was. But then also, it became pretty taxing for just Lori and I. We'll share more about that in just a minute. But we also had to think about bringing in the right couple. Uh, and I'm going to let... Lori, share about a couple. Yeah, we were we were feeling the burden and, and uh, getting a little weary and tired. I know I'm sure you've been there before, and uh, we felt like we needed we needed help. And we we talked with Chicago and we said we really really need help with the church and we're getting we're getting weary. And and so what happened was we they actually were able to send us a couple, Wilner and Chantel Cornelly to help us with the church. And, and they're a couple that we, we never worked with in the ministry. We, we knew them through the Midwest churches, but we didn't really know, know them. And they were willing to come. They were uh, empty nesters at the time. And they were willing to come. They're from Haiti. So, you know, definitely they helped with the diversity on staff for us because uh, we're very white and uh, we needed some, you know, diversity too. But you know, they came, and they came with a spirit of, we are here to help you. We are here to do whatever you want us to do, and we would love that part about them. But Chantel, you know, when, when she got there, um, we, they lived with us for two months. They, didn't, they couldn't get a house, so they lived with us for two months. And, you know, you get to know someone pretty well when they live with you for two months. And uh, day in and day out and, and learning the, min the ministry there. So it was, it was a lot of fun. We found out we had a lot of common things. Obviously, we we're not exact age, but close in age. Our kid, you know, we were empty nesters. And, and uh, you know, we had made lots of moves in the ministry. They were, they were actually more uh, schooled in the missions outside of the states. But, you know, we all made moves, many moves for the ministry. Our kids... We are, our kids were the same ages almost, and then uh, even Chantel and I had, you know, with our age, we had little, you know, taking turns with menopausal issues, you know, and <laughs> we would just help each other out. So we just, we just got really close with them, of course. But she came, and she came and gave me a second wind, and I was so appreciated that about her. She came with a strong faith and a, a humble heart and a willingness to serve in whatever way possible. So she and I were side by side, and she really held my arms up for that. And, and you know, second wind is just an extra energy. It's an extra strength to give you when you're doing something that takes a lot of effort. And that's what she gave, uh, she gave me. And she was fresh eyes to see things I wasn't seeing in the church. She was a fresh ear to hear some things. She was able to talk to people, other, talk to some of the women that I wasn't able to really get in there with, you know, heart-to-heart -heart level. And uh, that was just a blessing. That was a blessing in the whole Mass is to get them. And we became super close, great, great friends. And uh, we need that. We need partners in the ministry yeah. to help us, regardless of the church size. They may be on staff, they may, may not be on staff, but you need someone there that's got your back and someone that, that can really help you um, 
with that. Yeah. So. I'd say with this, uh, you know, when you go into a situation like this, and I'm hoping many of you will choose to do that at some point in time if you're called, uh, you don't know how it's all going to work out, but you have to believe that the Spirit will provide what you need. Uh, we didn't know. We tried a lot of couples, and it didn't work out. And then all of a sudden, this worked out with Wilner and Chantel, and uh, we became lifelong friends uh, from that moment on. If you miss out on opportunities to serve in this way, then you're going to miss out on opportunities to be transformed by God. There's some lessons that you'll learn, as we did, and some character that needs to be formed in all of us. But these things don't get formed just simply by studying the Bible with people and baptizing. A lot of this God brings into our lives as a result of hardship, suffering, and just laboring and toiling uh, and being patient with all of that. Uh, there wasn't a lot of joy in numbers. Our numbers were, in, like in Acts 6, it says the number of disciples was increasing. Uh, the number of disciples were decreasing there. Uh, eventually, the church turned around and it started to grow, and, uh, and it's in that state even now. But there were some hard lessons learned. While I was there, I had five of my very close friends pass away. My, if you can have a soulmate, uh, Jeff Balsam was that for me, and I'm looking at Susan and getting choked up right now. Uh, many of you know Jeff. He was an elder in the Chicago church. Uh, Wilner was that. The same weekend that Jeff passed away, a good friend uh, of, of ours, a couple that we had uh, hired in when we led the Cincinnati church, uh, Marshall Hopkins, he was one of the elders down there. He died very unexpectedly one night that same weekend. A couple others, Jim Fulcher and uh, a couple other people that you probably wouldn't know, but very dear friends. Then... In my state of despair, I mean, I didn't realize how I was discouraged. It was already a battle with the church, and then this, and so I decide I'm going to get out of this. I used to play some basketball uh, after high school and college. My form of basketball was usually full contact, and uh, anyway, so I, I started going back to the Y. I started to get back in shape. I was playing basketball you know, backward dunking and all that kind of stuff. I got in a pickup game one, one afternoon with some 20 and 30 year olds. I was actually doing pretty good and then I went for a loose ball and all of a sudden my Achilles popped. And I mean popped. It rolled up behind my knee and uh, then I had surgery. Sorry for the graphic details. I'll try to get that out of your head. Uh, but then I was laid up for about six to eight weeks and I was sitting in our backyard we had these little hammock chairs that I would s sit in for quiet times and stuff feeling sorry for myself and Lori walks up to me and says you know maybe God just wanted you to slow down and trust more in him instead of yourself which I didn't really like her saying that you know but it was true it was really true God has a way of slowing us down and learning some character stuff about us. She's going to share about herself instead of me sharing about her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, if you've led a church for a while, you, you kind of go through ups and downs, you know, it's the, the roller coaster thing with your faith and things like that. And depending on what's happening with the church, you don't, that, you know, if your faith's not strong, you're going you're gonna to tank a little bit. And there were periods of that in Detroit, and, and there were periods of loneliness and periods of, what the heck am I doing here? Why am I here? And uh, I went through that a lot on my prayer walks and crying out to God and everything. I just felt like I was in an unknown territory for a while. I just felt like uh, just in the battle and out of place and insecure in some ways and when things weren't going well. But... The thing that I learned in Detroit for me, which was good for me, was just uh, the fact that God's promises hold true. And I had some scriptures that I really needed to cling on to so that I could just remember 
that God is with me. And here's some scriptures I wanted to share with you. I'm just going to do them real quick. But um, 2 Corinthians 9, verses 8 and 12, where it says, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. That God gives us everything we need for our work. It's not a problem. He's there for us. 2 Corinthians 12, in there it says, God's power is made perfect in weakness. We know that one. Romans one uh, seventeen. the righteous will live by faith. God really calls us to live by faith. By faith, it's like you're blind, but you know there's a way. There is a way, and you just can't see it in that sense. Jeremiah 10.23 says, It's not for man to direct his steps. It's, it's God. It's God's directing our steps. Yeah. We know that he's in control. Uh, we, we try to think we are, but it's, it doesn't work. <laughs> John 15.5, Apart from me, you can do nothing. Romans 8.31, if God is for us, who can be against us? And then as I, Isaiah 41.10, do not fear, for I am with you. I will strengthen you and help you. You know, God was, through, it was with me even through all my insecurities, all my faithlessness at times when I was just dragging and just wondering, you know, just wanting to give up. And I'm sure you've been there before. You just, I just want to give up. This is just too hard. And these scriptures were ones that helped me out a lot. But when we went to Detroit, we went for the people. We went for the hearts that are, that are there. We went for the people, people that didn't leave and stayed. They wanted to stay in Detroit. And they're our heroes. They're my heroes. I think. When we heard the history and everything that went on, we went, wow, you are my hero. I can't believe you stayed you know, and your faith kept you there, and you still love Detroit, and you love the city, and you want to see the city saved for Jesus. And, um, you know, every family has problems. Sometimes the problem is the parents. <laughs> Sometimes the problem is the kids. But, you know, we work it out as family, right? And, and that's what we do. We just have to work it out and make it happen. Yeah. So a result of all this, there's a pretty healthy church in Detroit. Uh, Mark and Ruth Kang, who we had hired in Milwaukee before we went to Detroit, we were able to just swap. Uh, they went to Detroit to carry on what we had started. And, uh, and we're back in Milwaukee now, but the church is there. It's growing. People are maturing. It's getting closer back to the 300 mark again. And uh, it's like super encouraging. And I, I just want to leave you with this last thought. How many other Detroit situations are out there? You know of some yourselves within your family of churches or maybe even sections of the church that you're in. And what I would like to appeal to all of you is to at least be open-minded and consider. Uh, we've tried to be pretty open and honest with what went on in the church and what went on with us. But the net result is people grow, they change, they're, they can be revived, and I think this is one of the growing needs in our movement that we need more people like yourselves that are willing to step out of your comfortable lives where you are and be willing to take on some of the more challenging situations wherever they may be, amen? amen. Uh, and so I would just ask, is the Spirit calling you to do something like this. We'll leave you with that. Thanks.